Feldy, and welcome to this edition of the Book Club of the Year for Young Adults. This month we're talking about, I guess you could call it a science fiction book. It's called City of Ember. It's written by Jean Duprau. And my trio of uh, literary critics today are all from Polytechnic Middle School in Pasadena. By the way, we're at Vroman's today, not at the downtown LA Library, which is where we usually broadcast from. Um, with me today are Daniela Jimenez. Nice to have you with us, Daniela. Thank you. And Christopher Gilbert. Thanks for coming in. Hey. Hey. And BK Ndefo Dahl. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me here. Well, let us start off. I guess, Christopher, you've been anointed as the one to tell us what the book's about. Well, it's about this city that's covered in darkness and is running out of supplies and everything everyone can think of. And so there's a general panic, and the two main characters decide to take it upon themselves to figure out an answer to the problem. And BK, where, where, what period of time are we talking about? Could you figure it out from the book? Actually, no. It seems like about I don't know, late 17th century technology, but at the same time from the prologue, it seems sort of futuristic when it starts out. But they did have electricity, so we know it's post whatever that is. Post Thomas Edison. I, I don't right? know you don't is. know. It didn't I just get to guessed. that. That's all right. Um, Daniela, why don't you talk to me a little bit about the various characters in the book? Um, well the two main characters are Dune Harrow and Lena Mayfleet, I think. And Dune's sort of this quiet guy who sort of likes to take things apart and he thinks he can figure out what's wrong with the electricity in Ember. And Lena Mayfleet is this girl who's really, really, she's really smart and she likes to run a lot. And mm. <laughs> so in the book, she draws out the job of messenger, which is to deliver like messages all over the city to people. But, uh, I mean, she doesn't draw it, but she wants it really well, bad. We should explain how this works. I mean, these are kids who go to school until the age of 12. Yes. Which, first of all, how does that sit with you? Would that be like enough schooling for you guys to go out and leave and get into the rest of the world? Well, um, since BK? they don't really know very much down there, they're sort of kept in the dark. Yeah, literally. There's, the yeah. <laughs> um, there's not very much to learn. Mm. So it probably would be enough if there wasn't was only that much stuff to learn. Okay, all right. Plus, they probably don't have enough supplies to take the schooling any further. Ah. And we'll get into the shortages that come in. So at age 12, what happened? They get their job, and they work with that for three years, five years? I think it's something like that, something an apprenticeship like that. of some sort, yeah. And then what happens? They and then they either get assigned a new job if they didn't work well, or they do that job for the rest of their lives. All right, and Daniela, Lena wants to be? She wants to be a messenger, and Dune wants to be an electrician's helper because he thinks he can figure out what's wrong with the electricity, but instead, she pulls pipe works, which is where you work underground with the pipes, and Dune pulls messenger, and he wants to trade with her. And so that's sort of how they spark off being together. All right, let's talk about this whole world that the writer has created. How realistic is it? Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher? It has realistic things in it, like where they live, its houses, everything. It's just a world that's complete darkness is something that we really can't fully imagine. Well, describe how they, how the writer um, describes that world to us. I mean, how do we, how do you get a sense of that? How does she really clue you in into what it would be like to live in that world? Well, some people try to leave, and they'll just walk as far as they can, and then they'll all just have a panic attack and run back, and no one can ever figure out what's further on, and they have no idea what's happening. And so they think they're just the only life anywhere. It's, um, it's interesting to me because this whole idea, I, I mean, I would think that if you lived for that many generations in an environment like that, you would adapt like you'd be able to see in the dark. But nobody seems to be able to see in the dark in this world, which I thought was kind of interesting. Well, I don't really think they okay. adapt because they don't live in the dark. The dark's just all around them, outside of the city. and they. The scared of it is they, they're really scared of it because they're brought up that way. So I don't see why they would really adapt to be able to just adapt to the dark. And, and the electricity is um, a reality for them, sort of. Except they don't know how it works. Except they don't know how it works, which also seems kind of interesting and strange. So, I mean, talk about, again, how the writer created this world. Is it, 
did she do a good job? Is it a little suspicious? Were there flaws in the logic? Where did it, did it break down for you at some point? Did you like the book? Let's maybe start there. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, good. All right, we got an agreement on that. Um, were there any problems? Do you have any problems with the logic at all in this book? Or did you buy it 100%? I couldn't really think of any flaws. Yeah. BK? Like, I'm sorry. The logic seems pretty much right. <laughs> I couldn't find anything wrong with it. Okay. So. Danielle, you were? Sort of seems like it could happen, but at the same time, you figure out how could it happen. Yeah. So. Is it a world you'd like to live in, Krista? I don't think so. They have no idea about anything else that we've become so accustomed to, like boats or any animal. When they see the fox at the end, when they finally escape, they think it's the most amazing thing ever. And it's something that everyone thinks is just a normal animal in our huge world. Talk a little bit about their schooling. though. They, they only have, what, they have three books that they all have to learn from? Mm -hmm. yeah, the City of Ember book, just yeah. all about the, the city. Book of Ember. Mm -hmm. And they're brought up to believe that they're the only light in the world of darkness, that there's nothing out there, so that no one will try to escape. Well, and it's also kind of interesting, because you guys have had enough history to know that at certain points of history, we also believe that we were the only ones out there until we ventured outside. And I guess maybe we could say that about planet Earth. You guys believers and we're the only ones out in the universe? Mm. No. No. <laughs> okay. yeah, there has to be life somewhere. Yeah. The universe is as big as everyone thinks. It's big. It's really big. It's really big. <laughs> <laughs> the idea, though, that um, that a society could get that, I don't want to say ingrained, almost inbred in so many ways. How many people do we think there are in the city? Around 200, 250, somewhere So not somewhere that many. Because everybody would know everybody yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. What about that idea that when you're 12, you... Um, get to choose, and not, you don't get to choose, but something gets assigned. thrust upon you as far as what job you're going to, is there a job that you would have chosen had you been living in this society? Um, Daniela? I don't know, I definitely wouldn't have been messenger because I can't run, <laughs> but I don't really know, I don't know what all the jobs were, so I can't really say. Well, if you thought about a society like this and all the things they needed, hmm. all the usual doctors and nurses and teachers and... I guess maybe a teacher, yeah. Teacher, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Christopher? I'd like to be in the greenhouse and see all the actual living things, yeah. not just darkness and then bricks, houses, and ground. Describe that greenhouse, because I find that kind of interesting, because this is a society we find out is underground, but that whole idea that they can actually grow vegetables seemed interesting to me. Describe what, what that was like, what, what the writer describes that warehouse environment is like, greenhouse environment is like. It just seemed like rows and rows and rows of patches of any type of vegetable and it was either UV lights or fluorescent lights up the top that just covered the whole roof so that the plants actually got enough light. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, at one point the potatoes get a, a blight. Yeah. 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 So Which is actually what really happened. That's the real reason that uh, so many of the Irish came to America, was what they describe as happening to the potatoes in the book. That was actually what happened to potatoes all over Ireland, and people were starving to death. So. Except they had nowhere to go this time. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. What what job would you pick, BK? Um, I didn't really think about it. So. Hmm. So you would have gotten stuck with a really crummy job because you wouldn't have thought of that. Mm. No, it's randomly assigned. <laughs> You're right. You're right. I thought it was like The Giver, sort of. Which was a book we did in book club a long time ago. Describe the similarities. You don't think so? You didn't? You're laughing. Why are you laughing, DK? No, I just told myself beforehand that I wouldn't make any references to The Giver because everybody Why? says that. <laughs> everybody says it. Well, it's sort of the classic science fiction future, but there's differences. I mean, start off with the similarities and let's talk the about the differences. Um, well, they're curious about what's outside of their community, for one, like in City of Ember. And also, they get assigned jobs, like, they don't get to choose. It's a more brutal world in some ways, the one that Lois Lowry yeah. describes in The Giver. Oh, yeah. Actually, in this book, people are allowed to have feelings. In The Giver, they aren't. So. What other similarities and differences? BK, you reacted so violently. <laughs> Why? 
similarities and differences. Um, Greece? <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, the City of Ember seemed a little bit like the end of The Giver. Mm. When the boy leaves and they all get their memories back, it seems kind of like, I don't know, a downgrade of The Giver City. Mm. Kind of like they fell into this horrible life. Mm. Are you guys science fiction fans? I am. A little. More no, fantasy. Not, not really. Yeah. What do you like to read? Um, BK? I like to read, um, my favorite author is Orson Scott Card. Yes. I read all his books. We did, which one did we do? Yeah. I have to think. And I'm reading another one of his right now. I have to think which one we did. I can't remember. It'll come to me in a minute. Christopher, what do you like to read? Fantasy. Which one? All fantasy. Like Aragon? Aragon? Yes. I probably know that. <laughs> How do you know that? Have you read the second one already? No, I'm about to start. I did. <laughs> it was too long. That Aragon went on forever. But that was just my opinion. <laughs> but I'm not a big fantasy mm. fan, so that could be a problem. How about Chronicles of Narnia? Have you read any of those? Yeah, I read those. I'm not sure if I finished the series. Yeah. The but Hobbit series? The Hobbit series? Yes. The Hobbit was my favorite of all the Ring series. And what about Madeline Langle? You don't like fantasy, but how about Madeline Langle, Regal in Time? Um, she was okay. Just okay? Not yeah. really? can do it. I like, like, true life stories. Right now I'm reading Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul. Oh, so. all right. So, and are you more of a nonfiction fan than a fiction fan? Um, I don't know. I like both. I like realistic books. Okay. I'm sort of the opposite from those two. Gary Paulson, <laughs> the adventure kinds of realistic um, books, or not really? Sometimes. Historical? Occasionally. Um, I like modern day books also. Well, let's talk about this book. Again, it was, it was a fantasy. You know, it is science fiction. But are there lessons or warnings? Or is there an echo for us in our society today that you could see from this book? There's a line at the end that says something about how could anyone destroy this world because it was so beautiful and there was plants everywhere. It was all full of life. And we have big cities, power plants, and almost the opposite in some places. So a real environmental message, sort of <laughs> sub-message that's in there. And also, yeah, BK? I think it seemed like at the beginning, the builders were planning for sort of apocalyptic war, nuclear war. Mm. So they decided to it's underground. So they built the city underground with that box, telling them to come out, hopefully when the war would be over. Well, that was what and I then, was wondering, is why did they end up down there to begin with? I mean, was it an environmental crisis, or was it war, or...? Well, a nuclear war is sort of an environmental crisis. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true, it is. <laughs> You're right about that. Um, are there other kinds of echoes from this book that are lessons that we should pay attention to, Daniela? I think it's mostly the environmental okay. lessons you see. Yeah. Okay. Um, I also thought that all, the whole idea about infrastructure falling apart I mean, I'm a geek because I work in public radio. One of the things we talk about all the time, as a matter of fact, this week we did this conference on infrastructure. These civil engineers got together and they came up with a report card to grade how well things work. So the two that I was involved with, one was on roads and highways, which got a D minus, I think, or a D. And the other one was urban runoff, which is, you know, when you wash stuff down in the storm drains and how does it end up down at the beach, um, which got a D minus. But that whole idea that the things we have built, like um, the LA River, you know, that concrete thing, how long will it last? You know, is it falling apart? How much money do we need to invest in this kind of stuff for the future? There was a news story today about um, the, the uh, aqueduct that brings water from Northern California. Sorry, Pup. Um, will it last if we have a big earthquake? I mean, those kinds of things are sort of the question. And I thought that was kind of what this got into, too, was infrastructure needs. If you're, if you're living in this artificial environment, which I guess we are on top of the ground, but they were definitely down below, how long is something meant to last? You know, is, uh, to me, that was sort of the real-life lesson. That well, not most of the things were meant to last about 200 years when the box was supposed to open. Ah, I need to explain the box. But, well, <coughs> when the builders built the ember, they left a box with the mayor and had a time block on it and it was supposed to open 200 years afterwards so that they would have instructions to leave ember when the war, sh I think the war, mm -hmm. should be over and it would be safe to go up and sort of start over. And then the seventh mayor I think it was, was corrupt and 
he got sick and he thought the box might hold something that would cure him and he took it home and tried to break it open with a hammer but then he died and he got stuck at the back of a closet and he's Lena's great great grandfather I think well, somebody was at any rate the, yeah the seventh mayor and so she finds it at the back of her closet and it's already open I think it's been open for like 40 years which is why everything's falling apart and running out and then her little sister chews on it and makes most of it hard to read, <laughs> impossible to read. <laughs> so she and Dune get together and try and figure out what it means and they eventually find out that it means it's the way out and they understand it and get out. You know that um, idea about the that mayor taking the box thinking he would find a cure and then the current mayor who's hoarding food and all, everybody else sort of reacting um, in a situation where there seems to be a lack. I mean, the, to me, that was another thing. It, are there correlations, are there lessons to be learned for us if we were in such a situation where, you know, light bulbs are running out and vitamins are running out and cans of peaches are disappearing off the face of the earth? How mm -hmm. would we react in situations like that? I don't know. Did, did it make you nervous about the state of mankind, Christopher? Yeah, a little. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> just. I just couldn't fathom what it would be like to be running out of everything, even shoes or things are, that are most basic. Yeah, they were and really good at recycling. Yeah. I also thought it was interesting how the people didn't know that there were shortages yeah. and they thought there weren't. That, but that whole idea, though, about how would we react, um, or how do we react, you know, when there's a perceived shortage of anything. I think in terms of like gasoline lines, you know, and the people. I remember it was like the day after Katrina hit, and there were news stories about how there would be a gasoline shortage. And I drove by three gas stations, and there were like a hundred cars in each of the gas stations because people were panicked that the gasoline would run out. And it's like, what is that in us as human beings that makes us act, if I can use the phrase, badly? You know, add like that we're not, that we can't work together to make something work. Instead, we think about, how's it going to affect me? How can I get out of this? And I don't know, I mean, the book doesn't offer a whole lot of, I don't know, does it offer any hope that we can work together to solve problems? I hope so. <laughs> Well, yeah, eventually they all work together and get out. That's right, Lena so. and Dune work together. And oh, really? you're right, I'm talking about the, where they leave the hint at the end of the next one. Yeah. And you stop doing that. Then again, like, when they tried to tell people that the mayor was being bad, they were, like, wanted for spreading nasty rumors, so. And that the whole authority was in on it. And they were going to keep the poorer people, the less fortunate, who didn't have government jobs or being guards just out of the way and they would never know what they don't know won't hurt them. I wonder if that was a commentary on society today or not. Mm. And also the people who had learned about it like that guard who when Lena first meets um, he wasn't in on it mm -hmm. but when she told him he still didn't really want to believe it Um, we, we kept coming back to, and, I, and laughing about this, but the whole idea of light and dark and darkness, and talk a little bit about that metaphor of, you know, the, the literal darkness of this story and the darkness of the souls of these people who live in this place. Um, I mean, talk about her choice of that strong image of that blackness um, as a sort of a way to tell a larger story. Or did you see that? at all. I mean, I, when she's talking about that darkness, I kept thinking, well, in a lot of ways, they live in this dark world, but in a lot of ways, you know, their insides are dark, too. There's a dark side to people, as well, that keeps coming out. I mean, we keep talking about lightness and dark, and it just seems to keep coming up in the conversation. I thought it was mostly fear of it. Fear, fear of the fear, darkness. Yeah. And it's, like, not something that you should be scared of, but you are. You just, I like, can't really explain it. Yeah. So. It seems just kind of like they were all so desperate 
they would do anything to keep themselves ahead. Yeah, it's kind of a bad world. Um, when they did the word puzzle in here that they're trying to figure out, were you guys good at figuring it out before the characters in the book were? No. No, no, Daniel, no. Yeah, uh -huh. not the whole thing, but I you could figure out a lot of it. A lot of it, yeah. Christopher? Yeah. I would figure out bits and pieces, but then it'd just be a jumble in the middle, and I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, I thought, I'm not going to waste time. I'll just keep reading, and she'll figure it out, or maybe they won't. <laughs> then I don't have to think about it. What about the... Um, this is what I've noticed a lot of young adult books seem to be doing these days. Like you get to the end of the book and then there's another 20 pages at the end that's sort of a, yeah. the first 20 pages of the next sequel. Like it, hate it, cheesy, works I good. Didn't, I didn't want to read it. Don't you read it. I think, it's, I think it's sort of a cheap trick to get you hooked on the next book. To get out and buy it. Oh, and somebody has the next book out there in the audience, yes, yes. Yeah, that's probably our teacher. <laughs> <laughs> who, by the way, we should yep, mention, yes. Armel Webster at Polytechnic, who uh, brought you guys in today. Well, if you were, now you said, Danielle, that you like to read true to life books. I mean, give me an example of your favorite book besides Chicken Soup with a Teenage Soul. Um, not so much a true life book, but something that could actually happen. I like books by Meg Cabot. I don't know Meg Cabot. What kinds um, of, she what? wrote The Princess Diaries. Oh, okay. I do know that. So that's fun. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. I like it. Christopher, what do you like? Um, I don't really know. I haven't quite figured out besides fantasy. I do like some science fiction. Mm -hmm. I didn't really like the Ender's Game. I'm going to try to read that's it again. That's what it was. Ender's Game. Orson Scott Card. That's what we read. Yeah, that's a very depressing book. I can never get past the first chapter. How about Just, Heinlein? Are you a Heinlein fan? Or? I don't know. Don't know. Or Asimov? Or you, Ray Ooh, Bradbury? Yeah. Rat Bradbury? I'm not so sure. Yeah, okay. Mm. Well, you've got a whole lot to... That's one thing good about science fiction is there's so many really, really good writers out there that, and they write a lot. So, what about you, BK? Do you have a genre that you latch onto? Science fiction. Science fiction. Definitely. Who's your favorite author? Orson Scott Card. Oh, okay. Oh, we already went that. through that. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I also like Ray Bradbury. Yeah. And Garth Nix. I don't he's know Garth Nix. He's actually a fantasy writer mostly. He writes some science fiction. Well, how much, you know, given how much reading you guys have to do in school, how much pleasure reading do you get a chance to do? A lot. A lot. Do you really? Yeah. It's because you guys are readers. Yeah. This book club is great. We're reading books that we wouldn't normally read. Tell me about the book club. Um, we've read The Girl with the Pearl Earring. You're City kidding. Room. Yeah. Wow. Mm. That's sort of not exactly what I would think of as middle school reading material, but do you like it? Yeah. It okay. was good. And then we saw the movie in class. Yeah. <sighs> Not as good, but still yeah, we didn't yeah, like I that so much. That oh, um, yes. And we read The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Wow, and what did you think of that one? I thought it was so good. And yeah. who picks your books? How do you choose books in the book group? Well, the first couple Madame chose. <laughs> and now we're starting to suggest some of our own. Like, I'm making the rest of Book Club read Ender's Game. Okay, good. Well, Ender's Game is good. It's depressing, but it's good. Actually, I thought of one more book that I like, and what? it's a true story. It's um, called Rain of Gold by Victor Villasenor. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So well, you're picking good writers to read. Oh, well, my dad's a history teacher, and he recommended it. <laughs> well, that's really good. Yeah, I really liked it a lot. Now, how did the book group start? Um, we just... It's an elective class. Yeah. yeah, but most kids, I would think that, you know, if you have a chance to get out of the classroom or the library, one would want to be outside. How is it... I mean, is this something you meet at lunchtime or after school or you get out of a class period? Actually, every Thursday we have to have a two-hour period called block. <laughs> and this year... How creative. What a great uh, word. Yeah. The block. The block of time. And this year we get to choose which ones we have. It's in three rotations. And we chose book club for our first rotation. So now you have to meet for two hours every Thursday. And how many kids are in the book club? Eight. Yeah. Eight. And are there rules for the book club? Rules. Really finish the book. Yeah. <laughs> Read. Are you not allowed to discuss the book unless you finish the book? You go outside and finish it yeah. if you haven't finished it. That's always the problem with book group, with adult book groups that I've been in, is it gets to a point where no one finishes the book and then the book group just kind of falls away. I'm glad to hear you guys are still meeting. Actually, I didn't pick to be in book club. I was just assigned it. So. <laughs> you got I actually it. like a lot of that. And now you like it. Yeah. 
Well, the book that we read in this book club of the air this month is called City of Ember. It is by Jean Dupro. And I hope you'll join us again next month. We usually meet at the downtown Los Angeles Library in the children's reading room. You can come on down and watch us put a TV show together. But thanks so much today to our guests from Polytechnic, courtesy of the teacher, Armel Webster, Danielle Jimenez, thank you very much, and Christopher Gilbert, thank you, sir, and BK and Defo Dahl, thank you very much. I appreciate thank you. that. And I uh, hope you'll join us again next month. I'm Kitty Feldy. Thanks a lot. So who's reading what right now?